Whoa. Great. <laughs> Mr. Sion. Yeah, it was good. What'd you learn? <clears throat> I learned about uh, <clears throat> how do I respond to fear, frustration, and uh, his example was uh, Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier. Yeah. How his plane was shaking. He was breaking through the resistance of those molecules, however it works. And broke the sonic, uh, the sound right, barrier. Right. The sonic boom happened. And he said, your greatest victories will be right before the greatest resistance. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, that's a great example, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people know, uh, Chuck Yeager died out in the in, in the uh, desert over Windover, uh, test piloting a plane uh, that they were trying to you know break the other beyond other barriers. And he shortly thereafter, not too long later, uh, passed away out there in, in Windover over the skies. So there you go. There's the there's the downer part of the story. Just kidding. I'm kidding. No, I, to I totally, I remember, uh, you know, who we heard that story from uh, was, I mean, we're talking probably 20, 25 years ago, was uh, Matthew Ferry, who told that story. And man, it resonated to us at such deep levels, because it's almost like you feel like your world's falling apart. The thing I've often said, and I think it comes, and I'll paraphrase, but I think it comes from Jim Rohn or Tony Robbins or someone, which is when someone's confused and there's confusion going on, that means there's going to be a significant breakthrough. So you start looking at all the things that are going on when we're so confused, if we'll keep going. So the statement, when we don't know which direction to go, just keep going. And so many people pause or paralyze or retreat when the reality is they're, 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 you know, right there. Or you, you take the example of, uh, Napoleon Hill's book, where he talks about the big diamond or gold mine in Denver, where the guy loses everything, found it, loses, found it, had enough money to buy all the equipment because of the gold he found. Then he lost the main vein, and then some guy brought it uh, and sold it, lost everything. Then brought back a uh, uh, an engineer or you know a geologist, and they found the main vein again. It was two feet away from where he had stopped digging. And then it became, of course, some, you know, big time uh, uh, gold mine over there in the Colorado area. Uh, I brought up an example, too, of in Saving Private Ryan when they're looking for Ryan. Uh -huh. And they see this nest on a hill of German soldiers with an 88 machine gun waiting for soldiers to come through. And uh, Tom Hanks says, we need to attack this. And one soldier says, I don't feel good about this. And he says, when was the last time you felt good about anything? And so regardless of how you feel. Yeah. Do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And there's such a balancing act to that, right? Is to, there's so many things where we have, have, we have moments where we do what we feel like doing. And there's moments where we know what we're supposed to do. We know it's the path to doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we agree with it. And then the question is, is how we will we manage our pain around it? Will we proceed or will we retreat or will we dabble? I mean, all sorts of things. So, yeah, spot on. That's good. All right. Well, mine may not be as incredible, Ruby. <laughs> yes, it is. I don't know. I don't know. I only said that to shake you up. That's right. I recently wrote in my journal these things. I wrote down, what do I want? I then wrote down number two, why do I want it? And then number three, I wrote down what would be my plan to get it? And number four, how would I remain? Oops. I, don't, I got ahead of myself. Do not write that yet. I missed, I missed number four. Sort of. I mean, I know what it is. Then what would be my schedule that I'd have to follow? And then I got ahead of myself. And number five is accountability. And how will I remain accountable? That platform for my life has been really the guiding blueprint when I'm most on my game or fairness, when I'm most off my game. 
And when I'm off my game, it's usually because I've forgotten what I want and I forgot why I want it. And then I get lazy and don't put a plan together, some type of a blueprint. And then I don't have a schedule that I'm rigidly, truly rigidly following. And if I'm not following my schedule and I'm not following my plan and I've forgotten what I want, my insurance policy comes down to the fact of how accountable will I be? And what will I institute for my accountability to ensure that I succeed and that I do what I'm supposed to do? Each one of these, I think, has an importance to it that is different and unique in every single way. When you put a little bit of desire or emotion or the why around what you want, that fuels you with the energy necessary, despite how much rest you may get, sleep you may get, you know, tiredness, exhaustion you may get. You just keep going because you know what you want and why you want it. And I had a wonderful video that was sent to me by an agent yesterday who sent me a video from where they love to be and something that they're working towards. And they said, hey, coach, I just wanted you to know that I haven't forgotten and I'm reminded as to why I want what I want. And I just want you to know that I get it. I'm reminded as to why I want what I want. And I'm now even more committed to getting it. And so I think, again, this oftentimes becomes the fuel but then there is the pragmatic that the 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 almost want to say the mundane the boring the the structure probably is the best word or or I used to say a ton I don't say it as much but the process the process is you have to have a plan right you have to have a schedule and you have to be accountable and the thing I found in all of those three or five areas that I don't know if one is more important than the other because if you have a schedule, but you don't even know why or what you want to, what, what you want and why you're doing it, well, then this schedule becomes very mundane. But it's, but but every one of these things can become what I would consider it to be a ritual, which to me, if I listed words under there, that would mean it would be sacred, it would be holy, uh, it would be spiritual in most cases. Uh, it would be, uh, uh, I'm going to put here, uh, reverence, oops, gosh, reverence, there'd be a reverence, a sacredness, a holiness, a spiritualness to the rituals of our lives. And, and, and when we use the words mundane, boring, it's my routine, it is my process, I'm not saying those are bad words. But I can certainly say that if my rituals of my schedule, my accountability, my plan, reminding myself what I want and why I want, and it becomes something that is really sacred to me, and it becomes ritual or a ritual or ritualistic, then all of a sudden these things become so much more relevant and important to me. And I activate them and I go and I approach them in a much different way. So for me, this has really been part of my, my my guide. There's other parts which we could talk about mindset, skills, disciplines, systemization, and we could add all those things into it. But man, this basic formula that when I'm off or I'm unmotivated or I'm not driven or I'm not committed or I'm not following my schedule or I'm ignoring accountabilities or trying to avoid them or I don't remember my plan or my blueprint, it almost always comes back to figuring out what I want and, and again, reminding myself, well, wait a second here. Why do I want these things, right? Why do I want to be healthy? Why do I want to have great relationships? Why do I want to have this power in regards to my desire that fuels my actions? It's where you see the Grant Cordones of the world where they sit back and they say they have a notepad with them. And in that notepad, they follow it everywhere and they make sure that they're listing over and over and over again, what do I want? Why do I want it? And they and, and he's constantly writing it. It was the same thing. I, I sat on Mike Ferry's private planes and I would sit there and I'd watch him with his yellow notepads and he would be writing down his goals. And for years, and I don't know if he's still talking about this, but 
he had just turned 75 years old. And I said, hey, what are you doing? He goes, I'm creating my 10-year plan. I said, you're 75 years old. He goes, yeah, this is my 10-year plan. He started to share some of it with me. Then I, I, I remember uh, when Grant Cardone, going back to him, I remember when he said to his wife, hey, we should get married, but I need you to promise me one thing. You'll never, ever stop me from getting me what I want and why I want it, basically. So the thing I see that anyone who achieves extraordinary results in their life, they're not worried about how much time it takes. They're not worried about the energy they're going to have to exhaust. They're not worried about how hard they have to work. They're not worried about how difficult it's going to be. They're not worried about how long the hours are or how everyone else isn't doing the same thing. Well, how many Mike Ferries are there? How many Grant Cardones are there? How many are there people who are such outliers in this life that we live in that you sit back and go, well, wait a second, if I pay attention to all the people who aren't doing it, you'd be justified. I mean, just the fact that you're here this morning and people online and there's 500 agents in this company, you, know, you sit back and you wonder, like, wait, what, what is it that they're doing? I can tell you what they're doing, nothing. So often, so many of them are doing nothing. Do you realize that 50% of the agents in this state and in the country have not sold a piece of real estate this year? Do you realize that this month alone, you're going to see who knows how many agents leave the business because just because board dues are due, isn't that this month right now? Yeah. July, right? Right? Which they expect anywhere between 10 to 25%, one out of every four, give or take, or maybe it'll be a little less than that, but it'll be a huge number. So again, I go back to, you pay attention to all the people who are not succeeding and going and validating yourself as to what they're doing, but then ask yourself, the ones who are making the millions and millions of dollars, what are they doing? Look at like whatever, and people say, gosh, quit talking about these guys. And I always think it's crazy. They say, well, it makes me feel bad when you talk about a Brian Burnett and what he does or other agents. And it's like, feel bad. What, what's wrong with you? You know, why we have people say, why do you give them all the accolades accolades? Because they're one of the few people that figured out that they know what they want, why they want it. They actually follow their plan. They follow their schedule. They're accountable to themselves, to their family, to others, whenever they're falling faltering. And it is literally a sacred ritual to the activities that they do. In the last summit, when Justin Nudy spoke, he said, brick by brick, you build your business. And I think about what has Justin been doing? Well, I know what he's been doing the last 10 or 15 years, brick by brick and consistency. He deserves everything he has yeah. because of what he has been doing too. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I remember Brian Burnett, his new licensee when he was at Mountainland uh, Realty. I remember he, when it was ERA, he was there with John Har. I remember competing with him out in the marketplace. And I would absolutely, and, and take this right away, it was a mean thing. I would annihilate him every time. Never, ever took a listing from him. Every time I went head to head with him, I absolutely obliterated him. Today, I don't know if I could say the same thing. He's so good at what he does because he's built it brick by brick. I remember Justin Udy, a brand new licensee. We were over in that building just across the way here. And I remember the first time I met him, he was doing lending. He wasn't even selling real estate. He had just gotten his license. He was just getting after it. And you, you look at these. I remember I met Amy Clark for the first time. She had sold nine homes. That was the most homes that she had ever sold. I was looking, I remember Jessica Terry, I mean, sitting down with her and Jared and she was going sideways, man, things were brutal. I think the most homes they'd sold were 15 or 20 homes in, in a year. I look at, I can see Brendan Lee's picture up on this. I, I mean, I look at all these different people that hardly were selling anything. And then they got this together where they really truly created these sacred activities to where a decade later, here are these people making millions on millions on millions of dollars. And you start recognizing that, that I, I mean, the number of times that I, when I wanted to sell a hundred plus homes a year, the number of Saturday mornings or the, you know, the, the handful of late nights consistently, I just paid the price. So when you start looking at all that, I wasn't going to bring this up, but it's the question I always ask, right? Is what do you have to do? Uh, number or well, what do you want is the first thing, which I've already said, but what do I have to do to get it? And the big question is it worth it is it worth the battle brick by brick is it worth the, the the challenge is it worth the time is it worth the effort is it worth the sacrifice is it and the answer is it it almost always is because 
and I haven't, I wasn't going to bring this up either because I want to jump into something else. But just if you have a great vision, when visions are good, right, and you have a vision, the hope is, is that the vision is better than before. The life that you're living for. So the easiest example I always give of this is that you look at the people who were in Great Britain. They came to the Americas because of two fundamental reasons which were freedom of religion and prosperity, economic freedom and religious freedom. And they said, we're out of here. And they said, let's go to America in so many words. So the vision they had is that it was better than before. And then the scary part or the, the amazing part is they had to sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice. And it was whether it was on the boats and coming across as an example on the Mayflower, there was a sacrifice. But the key thing about sacrifice is that it's temporary. And people forget that. They think that, oh, man, I'm going to have to do this forever like this. No, not until you get a little bit of momentum. And once you get some momentum in the right direction, you're able to back off of the tremendous sacrifice it takes. But there has to be a moment where you're sacrificing because you have such a clear vision, but you have to build your business to where you get true blue momentum. And until you get momentum, you have to sacrifice, but you sacrifice because you remember the vision because it's going to be better for you than before because of the sacrifice. And so all of a sudden, when you start recognizing what you have to do and what do you, what do you want, what do you have to do? The do would be the, the plan, the schedule. Right? And is it worth it? Well, only you can answer that. But when we talk about the Justins or we talk about the Bryans or we talk about other individuals, I sit back and I'm like, man, not one of them would tell you that it wasn't worth it. It wasn't that there's not one of them that would not say it wasn't worth doing what they've done to get where they are. And I would echo to you that that is the way I feel. I've looked at the tremendous sacrifice or the vision I've had. And there's moments where there's momentum and there's moments that are there isn't. And I come back and I sacrifice to keep the get the momentum. It's just the, it's the game we play. And I look at that and I say to myself, man, no matter what the equation is, it was still worth it. Just has been. No matter what, it's been worth it. So come back here. Where I, I, I want us to spend some time and I would love to see, when was the last time you looked at your plan? When was the last time you really not only looked at your schedule, but you followed it to perfection? Think about that. Followed it to perfection. When was the last time you truly followed your schedule? When was the last time you really either built, reviewed, and dialed in a plan? If you were building a home, you would have a plan. You wouldn't be winging it. You would follow a schedule. And if you were building a home for a particular client and you weren't following the schedule, has anybody had a builder who hasn't followed a schedule? Ever had one, Ruby? Yeah. Ever had anybody ticked off? Right? It, uh, and the, the reason they're mad is because the schedule's not being followed. Well, just think about your own business. If you don't have a plan and you don't have a schedule that you're following, well, how are you going to create the momentum that's necessary? You're just not. And again, I go back to you. People will continue to look at all the people. They'll look at two groups of people I look at it. And I think that they look at in this business. Number one, they look at the people who have had tremendous success and don't have to have this level of sacrifice to maintain the income that they have. Now, make sure you understand what I'm saying. They look at the people who are successful, who have some baseline of success in this business, I don't care whether it's a couple hundred grand, 500 grand, million dollars, whatever, but they have a baseline of success. So they don't really follow a plan and a schedule. They just kind of fumble and roll through life and roll through the business and have some success because of it. You know, from that standpoint, then you start looking at saying, okay, now, well, if they're just fumbling along and I'm looking at the people who are just doing that, well, and if you match up that same type of approach to the business, you're going to fail miserably. Then the other part that I see that they look at is that they look at the people who are not doing what they should be doing. So remember, they look at the people who have tremendous success 
and our BNLB, kind of, they're kind of on cruise control. Then they look at the people who are not doing everything that we're, I, I would be advocating to them. They're just kind of fumbling through and, well, you know, but they're not doing it. And, well, they're not doing it. And, well, this person's not doing it. But again, those are individuals that are failing. And then they try to match up with the people who are succeeding, but are not having to sacrifice because they already have enough momentum, most likely because of the years that they've been in this business, and they match their work ethic. They match their efforts in this business. And when you match the people who have all this momentum because of the years they've had in the business, or you start matching the momentum of the people who are really not succeeding high levels in the business, you are doomed for destruction, guaranteed. And so early on, I started to not pay attention to the 80% of the people who what I consider to be failing. I wanted to pay attention to the 20%. And then I would say, well, I'm going to pay attention to this 20%, but I'm going to look real closely at that top 20%. And I'm going to look at the top 1% is what I was always saying to myself. What are the top one percenters doing? I'm not interested in matching up someone who's just getting by or who's been stagnant with their income. They say, well, yeah, but look at this. I've been earning four or $500,000 a year. And I've been doing it year over year. Okay, well, then where's the stagnation? And if they're not growing in other areas of their life in monumental ways, then they're stagnate, stagnant. And the thing is, is I just didn't want to pay attention to those people. The people that I was interested in were these one percenters. What are they doing? How are they succeeding? What prices were they paying? Why did they think it was worth it? What skill sets did they have to develop within their plan? What mindset did they have to have? What schedule did they follow? What sacrifices did they make? That's who I was interested in, in following. And I watch people, again, follow people who are not following a rigid schedule. They aren't paying attention to their plan. They're just fumbling through the business. Their sphere of influence is calling them. They have some momentum because of their past successes. But that's not the people you should be paying attention to. In my world, they're failing. Now, they may be failing at a high level, but in my book, they're failing. Because I'm only going to pay attention to people who are growing. Because if you aren't growing, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're falling back. If you're not growing, you're not succeeding. If you're not growing, I guarantee you're not very happy. Because growth equals happiness. And when we stagnate and we stay stationary and we're falling backwards and we don't catch ourselves and go, no, 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 no more of that. If you don't catch yourself, you're going to continue to fall backwards. And you'll pay attention Again, to the 80% of the people are failing because here's the deal, closing up and wrapping up here. You will do only one of two things. You will either rationalize or, I always say this, yes, in business, you will repent. <laughs> you will repent. Because when you rationalize, this is the deal. Either one of these things makes you feel this, good. You repent and get on the right track in this business, you start feeling good. If you aren't feeling good, you will rationalize your way. Well, yeah, but look at the other guy. Well, look at what the, they're, they're doing. I'm doing better than them. And you'll start rationalizing your activity. You'll start rationalizing your lack of prospecting. You'll start rationalizing away your dreams and your goals because you will not remain in a state of feeling bad for a long time. So you'll either rationalize your nonsense away or you will repent and get your schedule right. You'll get your plan right. You'll get your vision right of what you want and then you'll wrap it and weave it with a ton of emotion and you will be accountable that nothing will stop you because you're not willing to be stopped. And so the problem is, is that most people, what do you think most agents do? They rationalize. They don't repent. They don't get their act together. They don't get dialed in because all they're worried about is feeling good. And the thing is, is that's not a bad thing, but ask yourself, how are you making sure you feel good? What rationalizations, what excuses are you giving? What justifications are you giving for not doing these things? 
And where is it that you decided to settle in and say that it was just okay to get by? And where did you say it was just okay to rationalize and excuse yourself so that you could feel good, but not really succeed? And you might even have a few successes and people will go, hey, nice job. But you know, if you were honest with yourself, deep down, you know that you're capable of so much more. So for me, it's about living well beyond just the norm, not in comparison to other people, but what could I do in relationship to what I could have done? And when I rationalize away my future, because I just want to feel good so that I don't have to make excuses, so I can make excuses and justifications. And do I think that so many of them will be good? And people will pat you on the back and go, oh, I totally understand, man, life is tough. It's brutal. I get it. I mean, I, I, I rationalized so much crap around my concussion. Because I didn't feel good. I couldn't think clearly. There was all sorts of reasons. And I could justify it. People would say, Ruby, oh, man, I totally get it. But there's no question that it set me back in all this stuff that I am telling you. Because I started doing what I believe everyone else does as a general statement. I'm saying generally. Because we all do it at some level. Otherwise, we'd have perfect relationships, amazing health, and amazing amounts of money. Just remember that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. I, otherwise, I'd be in perfect health, insane amounts of money, and every relationship would be almost to perfection because, well, I'd have to do all these things. And I'm not going to do them all the time, every part of my life. But when you start to wake up and you start to live a conscious and aware life, you sit there and go, man, no more. No more rationalization. No more excuses. No more justifying my complacency, my mediocrity, I am going to step forward. I'm going to repent and I'm going to get myself in line. And this is how I always have done it over the years. I sit down and I go, what do I want? Why do I want it? Even yesterday, I was saying to Jennifer, hey, tell me again, what it is you really want? And she started listing it off. And I was like, wow, I'm inspired by that. Because when I know what she wants for some reason, and I know why she wants it, and I've told the story of like the boat and there's other things in my life that have happened. I stop justifying and I start working harder and I start working longer and I start working more intentionally and intensely because I'm going to have what I desire. So again, you can either rationalize it away or you can repent and get on the right track. But here's what I do know. There's the answers to the test. And either those who are online, so good morning, those online, or those who are sitting here, you will at this moment make a decision as to who you choose to be. And you're going to walk out today, or you're going to get off on off this online thing, and you're or on the Zoom call, and you're either going to get it dialed in, or you're going to rationalize it all away. But there will be no middle ground when it comes to this business. Now, there'll be other areas of your life, but setting those aside, you will either rationalize or you will repent. You'll rationalize the amount of prospecting you have to do. You'll rationalize the doors you knock on. You'll rationalize the way the time on the phone. You'll rationalize your practice. You'll rationalize your getting up on time. You'll rationalize what time you go to bed. You'll rationalize uh, what, what you eat. You'll rationalize uh, you know how, how how you approach every part of this business if it's not in alignment because you're so committed to feeling good, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but consider the approach that you're taking to trying to feel good. If you will wake up, you will realize I got to repent because I want to feel good and I'm going to do it through my consistency, through my work ethic, through my passion and my desire to keep my word to myself, to following my plan, to following my schedule, to knowing what I want, why I want it. And man, I'm going to be accountable. I'm not going to back away from it. And when you start working from that space, then all of a sudden, man, you're willing to dial in this plan to nobody's business. You're willing to follow a schedule. It doesn't matter what it says, because if that's what you need to do to get what you want, because you know why you want it, you'll do it. You'll pay the price. So stop rationalizing justifying and excusing yourself from living as such a better and more extraordinary life. Make sense? Yes, Ruby? Yes, it does. Okay. 
and it sounds really good when I put it up on a piece of a paper or, uh, or a uh, dry erase board. But I can just tell you that you can have it all in this business, all of it, if you're willing to do what's necessary. I mean, are you willing to pay the price? And if you are, there's not much this business won't give you. The beautiful thing, what it can give you. Okay. Last thoughts? Jason, anything? Ruby? I think it's great. I think the hard part is the plan and schedule for me. Get it down and then... Yeah. I, I go through the want and the why all the time. And then I start planning it out and then it gets overwhelming. And then all of a sudden, I start over. Yeah. Yeah, the momentum starts over, right? I mean, and we all do it. It's that, guys, I, I do it. I mean, I we all do it. We we have ebbs and flows to our lives, but I didn't spend a lot of time on this part, but just remember, right? Great salespeople get people to focus on the right things. My job as a leader, right? Ruby's job as a leader, Jason's job as a leader, you as a leader to clients and to others is to get them to focus on the right stuff. That's my job. So if you're focused on the right stuff, then we ebb and flow because you're awake, you're conscious, you're aware, you're alive. Then all of a sudden we start paying attention. Like just ask yourself again, how do I make sure I feel good? Oh crap. If you're honest, I rationalize a ton of crap. A ton of it. I'm stopping that. I'm gonna do what I need to do. I'm going to get the job done. And all of a sudden, when you're awake and you're a conscious being to your business and to your life, you start waking up and realizing, wow, what, what, what am I doing? Why am I doing it this way? What's, what, am I, what am I thinking? Like, there should be hopefully a little bit of passion and a little bit of defiance, a little bit of like, I'm not doing this anymore this way. We hit that low party or that mark where like, whoa, no, 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 no. That is not happening here. And then the beauty is, if you'll just plug and play in the right stuff, you'll win. Everyone will win. That's the beauty. It's not an exclusive club. Success never has been. That's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how middle-aged you are, what your circumstances have been. It does not matter. That's, again, the other beauty of real estate. Now, you can live in your past. That's up to you. That's your decision if you're conscious about it. But if you're not living your past, you'll look forward to realizing, man, my past doesn't equal my future. My current circumstances don't equal my future. I am going to take this by storm. Okay. Ruby, do you have one last thing? Uh, I was just going to say, um, this is such a good reminder because sometimes life forces you to be very resilient. But if you just plan things out, you can actually pace yourself. Yes. Else life sometimes gets you to that point where you have to handle so much and you're like, wow, I, I can handle more. But we just limit ourselves to doing more because we think we, we don't have to. Yeah. But life will kind of put you in those spots sometimes. Yeah. Well, and, and, and we'll rationalize those, right? And we'll have those conversations within ourselves because we have to feel good. So we will justify, rationalize, excuse ourselves, you know, make sure we feel warm and fuzzy. And, you know, what if you just felt the, 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 the power of disappointment, the power of uh, being uncomfortable, the fire that is so intense at times, uh, that is so overwhelming and you didn't put it out. You didn't, you didn't, you know, you know, water it down with other excuses or other you know, pleasures, and you just simply just said, I am going to feel the pain. A lot of people will not feel the pain, right? It's the reason why you see people doing cryotherapy and ice baths and all these things, to feel the pain, to go, well, if I can do this, this, I can do that. Because the thing is, is we try to avoid pain, like, it, you know, of course, it's like the plague. We try to avoid difficult moments, like they don't ever exist. If you embrace the challenge, embrace the difficulty, you know, play in the fire, the torch, the heat, like let it, let it, let you, you're built to handle all of it. You, every one of you can handle it. Everyone can handle every emotion, every disappointment. I remember when I remember, I got to finish with this. Sorry. And we'll go. I remember a, a friend who said, I said to them, 
if this ha- I don't even remember what it was, Greg, but I said these words. If this happens, I would be crushed. And I remember he said, crushed. Could you please describe that for me? And I remember I paused just about like this and I went, uh, well, I feel really bad. Oh, so is it crushed, truly destroyed, like can't go on, or is it that you're just disappointed? You'll be sad. You'll have a moment of reflection and disappointment, sadness. Well, yeah. So why don't you describe the truth with truth instead of this craziness of I'd be crushed? What does that actually even mean? And it woke me up to the idea that maybe it's not so bad to feel pain. Maybe it's not so bad to have disappointment. Maybe it's not so bad to have moments where you feel like you don't know what to do. And they're the craziness of it. Maybe, just maybe, you are supposed to feel those things. Maybe, again, I would actually, not maybe on this, but you are for sure built to be able to handle those things. You're built to handle disappointment. You're built to handle uh, the judgments of others. You're built to have challenges. You're built to have, be in the fire. You're built for it. So once you engage in that, you know that you're built for it. You'll willingly accept the challenge. And that's where you see people like a Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, where he says, hey, you're built to experience these things. It's okay that you were disappointed. Just don't hold on to this one. Feel it and then let it go. I will not hold on to this. Feel it for a minute. Let it go. Okay. Others talk about this for holding on to it for 30 seconds or, I, you know, I'll, I'll be disappointed for one hour. And after that, I'm gone. I'm not going to let it happen anymore. But you have to be conscious unaware you have to be a human being that is feeling things so ruby you're gonna say something oh, let's pain, go pain, go ahead. pain is inevitable but how much you suffer is up to you yeah yeah it is how you how you hold on to it man there's a lot of people who want to stay stuck in their way suffer you know how bad it was let me tell you how bad it was really tell me well that's their rationalization of course they, they fixate on their suffering and they say, let me explain why I can't do the, what I'm doing because I'm out of my control. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and Jason, just make sure we all do it. I do it. You do it. The, the stupidness is when people are naive enough to say they don't do it. And then it's just a moment of time with them where I get to, you know, basically you listen to their dialogue and all of a sudden you hear it. But if- well, this and that, and you'll hear it. But after reading The Untethered Soul, I do it less. Yes. I, I agree. You don't hold on to it as long, right? That's right. So you've got read that book. It's a great book. Okay. All right. Let's have a great rest of the week. Let's finish strong. Good to be with you guys.